أبدا لن أنسى إسلامي لن أبقى في ليل ظلامي وسأبغ الفجر لأيامي وأطبق ديني ونظامي وأطبق ديني ونظامي كي يظهر نور الإسلام فالدنيا قد ملئت نورا وغدت أيامي ديجورا صارت بالباطل تنورا ونعيش بجهل وقتام والحل بدين الإسلام إسلامي ما كان بغيا ليكون عن الحكم قصيا بل كان نظاما قدسيا من عندي لا إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة O praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has made it possible for us to study his religion. The only religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with today. The only religion accepted by Allah is Al-Islam. إخبار من الله تعالى بأنه لا دين عنده يقبله من أحد سوى الإسلام An announcement from Allah سبحانه وتعالى that there is no religion accepted by Allah except Islam and that is to follow the messengers with what they came with finishing with the loss Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم so whoever meets Allah after the Prophet Muhammad, believing or following another religion, another way of life, it will never be accepted from him. And he will be from the people destined to eternal hellfire. وَالدَّلِيلُ ذَلِكْ قَالَ تَعَالَى وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا Whoever desires a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted from him. And today we find Muslims searching for happiness, tranquility, and contentment in everything but Islam. Depression won't be cured by distracting yourself from your purpose in life, whether it be by listening to music, nor will it go by working extra hours, opening up new businesses, nor will it help you by going on holidays or going out finding a new hobby. These are all the ways that the disbelievers try to escape depression. And as Muslims, we've been commanded to be different from their ways. They tell us 
that to escape depression, you have to busy yourself. Busy yourself with everything other than the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By busying yourself in sin will never take away the problem. You might say there's no sin in going on holidays with your spouse. But in reality, the holidays today are full of haram. From visiting places that are haram to places that have no benefit for a Muslim. Nor does the spouse benefit, nor does the children. And it brings you far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be deceived by thinking a trip to Europe or wherever around the world will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Five years ago, this was how the disbelievers would escape their depression. What they'll do, they'll book a holiday, a two day holiday, five day holiday, an escape, they call it. Today, we find the same trend by who? The Muslims. The sad reality today, everything that the disbelievers are doing, we find Muslims doing it. And what's worse is we find Muslims that are practicing involved in this. And this is something that we've seen. Many people take this path of traveling, traveling around the world, and coming back to nothing but more depression. So instead, we need to learn as Muslims that the cure for depression isn't in the things that the disbelievers do. It's definitely not in the things that they promote. If you see a disbeliever doing something, then know that this is not the way forward. So instead of traveling to Europe, Brazil, or wherever you go. Travel the lands to seek knowledge. If Allah gives you the ability, travel the lands to go and learn the Arabic language, to learn the Quran, to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to sit in beneficial classes and to contemplate over his creation, the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us to worship him and not for amusement and entertainment. So if you don't take this path, you're going to add to the problem that you're facing today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً بَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance for him will be a depressed life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us that if we turn away from his guidance, his religion, the chosen way of life, the perfect way of life, the life of seeking knowledge, the life of worshipping Allah alone, the life of being loyal to your brothers and sisters in Islam, not spying on them, not causing them havoc, not backbiting them, not slandering them, and the life of not waging a war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by entering into forbidden haram transactions like mortgages we see today and credit cards. Things that you would look at and think this is my new, this is small. The one who indulges in these things won't have a happy life. And if you've listened to it till here, then know Take this message home. The one who indulges in these things that I mentioned above, the one who goes out and gets a mortgage, is involved in credit cards, someone who likes to travel the whole world, thinking that this will benefit them, this will bring them closer to Allah, someone that lives a life of just opening businesses, 
working extra hours, taking up two jobs, know that you will never have a happy life. You will never have a happy life. Rather, he has promised to live in depression and misery. This is a promise that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do we see today? Right in front of our eyes, Allah's words testifying to people's actions. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي Whoever turns away from my remembrance, he doesn't practice the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated and commanded him to practice. Rather, he goes against the commands of Allah and he innovates his own way. He or she tries to find happiness through something that Allah doesn't like. They don't wear the hijab. They rather listen to music. As for the men, they rather just oppress and take things in their own action, in their own hands. All these actions would lead you to living a depressed life, a hard life, as Ibn Abbas told us regarding this verse, that you will have a chest, it will be tight, and you would have a hard life full of grief. As we see many Muslims today complaining about their life, their children, their businesses. The cure for not having barakah in your life is to live a life full of barakah, dedicating a portion of your day to remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that we don't see amongst the Muslims. Dedicating a portion of your day to rem remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, abstaining from gossiping and just talking for no purpose, as we see many sisters today on the phones. All they do is just talk or they're on their DMs. But what's worse, we find the brothers doing this more so my brother in Islam, if you own a business, make sure that it's halal. From the food that you sell in your restaurants to making sure no music is played in your businesses. These are things that remove the barakah. These are things that take you away from Allah. These sins, they don't just affect you. They affect your children. And then you find yourself not being able to practice, not being able to repent and not being able to do what Allah tells you, not being able to seek knowledge. And this is something that we find amongst the youth. They don't have this drive for seeking knowledge, not being able to change, not being able to live a life dedicated to Allah. And the only reason for this is because of the barriers, the barriers that are put in front of, of yourselves. And you've got yourself only to blame. Rather, what you find amongst the youth is that they blame Allah for every trial that they face. And this is what happens when you turn away from the reminders. It leads you to blaming Allah and the righteous people for every bad that happens in your life. Forgetting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the righteous people, they warned you and advised you long before any harm came your way. And this is the reality that we face. We have stopped accounting ourselves and our actions. The last time that we accounted ourselves may have been in Ramadan, if that. But in reality, we've stopped. We've stopped looking at our lives. Rather, we just tend to play the blame game. It's the easy way out. Blame Allah and blame those who try to help you. These are all evil traps that shaitan puts in front of you and he uses this to destroy you. So the way you get out of this vicious cycle is to bring yourself to account. Sit down with yourself and with your spouse and tell them, be honest with yourself. Tell them you want help, you want to change. Get them to point out your bad character and with the permission of Allah, that's how you'll cure yourself and you'll remove all the doubts and diseases that you have within yourself. And this won't happen over a week 
or a month. Rather, this is a lifetime commitment that you keep accounting yourself. Otherwise, this verse will be with you until you meet Allah. فَإِنَّهُ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً بَنْكَ For him, will be a depressed life. A life that has no ending when it comes to discontentment. You won't be tranquil and you'll be sad all the time. So the cure for depression is to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to follow his guidance the way he commanded us. And many Muslims, they claim that by doing this, by practicing Islam, they are still depressed. But when you ask them simple questions, you'll come to know that they haven't even understood Islam. The way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained it to us. Al-Islamu huwa al-Islamu lillah bit-tawheed wal-inqiyadu lahu bit-ta'ah wal-bara'atu min al-shirki wa ahli. It is to submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Tawheed, singling him out in his lordship, in his worship, in his names and attributes, and to surrender yourself in obedience, and to disassociate yourself from shirk and its people. This means that you can't join your family members, your neighbors, or anyone close to you in celebrating what's gonna be coming up soon Christmas, because this goes against submitting yourself to Allah in his lordship and in his names and attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rabbu samawati wal ard, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And they say, Jesus is Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not have a child, nor was he born. And you find today, Christmas is celebrated to remember the birth of Jesus, who Christians believe is the son of God. And the sad thing is, you find many Muslims following this, saying Merry Christmas at their workplaces. You find Muslims today finding more enjoyment in Christmas, shopping and loving these days, putting pictures of their lights, forgetting that the days that you're celebrating or that you're happy about are all done celebrating that Allah has a son. And they say, Allah has a son. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us they have come forth with an evil thing. And he mentions that the heavens are almost torn and the earth is ready to split and the mountains fall in destruction because they attribute a son to Allah. All the nice Christmas dinners, sitting down with family. And I wanna make a point here, something that many Muslims take very lightly and they don't understand. Making your parents happy will all be against you on the day of judgment. And in this life, you remain unhappy because you did things that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you chose your parents' pleasure over the pleasure of Allah. And this is what we find rampant amongst the Muslim communities where they put their parents and they treat them like they are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is another disease that is spread amongst the Muslims. It's like we've been created to worship our parents. And this is another reason why you will remain in depression. The reason we obey our parents is because of Allah. Write this down. The reason we obey our parents is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to obey them. And it is forbidden to obey your parents when it goes against the teachings of Islam. And this is what we don't find 
many Muslim speakers talking about today. They shy away from it because it doesn't attract the crowd. You hear in every khutbah how important it is to obey your parents. But you rarely find an imam or an Islamic speaker telling you that you should not live for your parents, for their culture, and you shouldn't listen to them if they tell you to buy a house on mortgage or to become a lawyer. The youth have become pressured by their parents to trim their beards, to not wear Islamic clothes. And when these youth, they go to the Imams or the Islamic speakers, what happens? He says, obey your parents, make them happy. But there is no obedience to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it goes against the creator. So what we find today is the youth getting pressure to study, study things that are imp impermissible, like man-made laws, or to join them in their innovative festivals or celebrations. And this is something that we find reverts new to Islam. And they don't know what's the difference. So you find them sitting with their parents, having Christmas dinner. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Imams and those who speak on behalf of this religion, they are held accountable for not explaining these things. Every year passes and we don't hear nothing from the Imams. They don't tell you that you're not permitted to sit with them. Rather, you should make bara from them, disassociate yourself from them clearly, openly, with respect to the parents. So you tell them that I cannot join this because Allah told me and forbade me from entering this gathering. This is a believer. This is someone who has understood Islam. Whether it be a birthday party or a Christmas dinner, none of these things can be justified in the sight of Allah. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, don't become brainwashed and pressured into living for people, whether it be for your family or friends. Culture is rotten if it goes against Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to take you out of being enslaved to all these false ways and traditions. He didn't just warn against worshiping sticks and stones and idols. Rather, he came to tell you that every path other than the path of Allah is a path to destruction for your hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all the ability to break through all of these false ways and to submit to the teachings of Islam the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and that was through the Quran and the Sunnah upon the methodology of the Sahaba for they were promised paradise and we want to be from the people of paradise. After saying all this, today we're going to go through the last part of the hadith. Hadith Jibreel it has taken us over 10 lectures to reach where we have come to and we're on hadith number two. And this is something to point out. We need to take our time when it comes to seeking knowledge. It's very easy to join a two-day course or a three-day course where it goes through all the 40 hadith. If you join these courses, these two-day, three-day courses that take a lump sum from you, we're not talking about whether it's halal or haram. Rather, we want to ask a question to the teacher and the students. Those two-day courses that go through 40 hadith or go through a whole book, ask yourself, what did you learn 
in those two days. Because it takes 10 lectures that are around one hour long to reach the end of hadith number two. And we find that these courses finish in one day. One day, maybe three hours long, maybe six hours, let's say for argument's sake. What do you learn in six hours? And the one who's teaching, he can't benefit you because this is how he was taught. And sometimes it's not the fault for the ones that are listening, for they don't know better. They see the name Sheikh, Ustad, graduate Medina, graduate this, and they get brainwashed easily, thinking that this, this person is someone of knowledge. Rather, this person is maybe even revising notes on you. And he's making a mockery out of you. He's maybe just reading. He's reading the 40 hadith, just to re re refresh his memory. He's benefiting and he's taking your money, but he's leaving you with nothing. In fact, he just keeps on telling you to come back for another book. And this is not the way that we learn knowledge. Knowledge is taught through process, slowly, so you can digest it, so you can benefit, so you can change yourself. So as I mentioned, it's taken us 10 lectures to reach where we have reached. And I'll read to you the last part of the hadith. فأخبرني عن أماراتها Tell me about its signs. So we learned that the hour has signs and it cannot come except through these signs. So for those conspiracy theorists who claim that in two years time or five years time that the world is going to end, these signs need to come first. They have to come. And for Muslims listening, they need to know that the signs of the hour, once they arrive, that's when the world would end. The major signs. So the first sign mentioned in the hadith, and tell you that amatu rabbataha. They are that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress. And that you'll see the barefooted ones. And I'll go for them word for word. The barefooted. The naked. The poor. The shepherd. يتطولون في البنيان competing each other in raising lofty buildings and there are a few explanations to and tell you that amatu rabbataha which is the first part the first line from them that there will be many con conquests towards the end of time. So there'll be many wars and the Muslims will conquer, which will lead them to having concubines and slave girls. And another explanation is that the times will change and the children will be corrupted. They won't listen to their parents, rather they will command their parents and they'll be like their master and the parents will be like the slave. And this is what we find today. I'm not saying this is what these signs are to do with today, but we do find this today that the children are like masters to their parents. So the statement here, the shepherds will go towards the city. So the meaning for this is that the shepherds here, those who 
are going to be competing. They are shepherds, they're poor. They'll go towards the cities and they'll compete with each other in building towers and tall buildings. Now, whether you want to relate this to today, we're seeing this happen, wallahu alam. But we do see this, that Arabs who were poor are now having the highest buildings. And after the Prophet Sallallahu explained all the important matters pertaining to the deen, it says, فُمَّنْ تَلَقَ فَلَبِثْتُ مَلِيًّا Jibreel went off. So this was Jibreel who came to ask the Prophet, as you mentioned in the previous lectures. He came to ask the Prophet regarding the signs. And after everything got explained to him, he went away. And then the Prophet Sallallahu waited and he said, Ya Umar, atadri man is sail? Oh Umar, do you know who that is? Do you know who the questionnaire was? Qultu, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Umar replied, Allah and his messenger knows best. Qala, fa'innahu Jibreelu atakum yu'allimukum deenakum. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, that was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he waited. And then he asked Umar ibn al-Khattab. He made him wait. And then he asked, do you know who that was? And then he gave him, he gave him the answer. Here the scholars, they say, we learn that this is a type of motivation in teaching. That you ask the student. You ask him. And you wait for the answer. And another thing we learn is the, the response of Omar. He said, Allah and his messenger knows best. Just imagine Omar radiallahu anhu. He's sitting in front of the Prophet. And he's asked the question. And he generally doesn't know the answer. What did he say? Did he just make up an answer? Rather, he, he said, Allah and his messenger knows best. And this teaches us that when we don't know something, we should humbly say, Allah knows best. And we shouldn't shy away from this term. And this is a term that one of my teachers, when I was listening to his lecture, he mentioned, if you ever want to teach, remember one thing. If you can't say Allah knows best, then do not start teaching. Learn to say Allah knows best. This is something that we don't find amongst the youth or amongst the students of knowledge where it's hard for them to say Allah knows best because they're there to attract people. They want to sound as if they are the scholars. Within they may not tell you this, but in reality, they want to be portraying themselves as people that have serious knowledge grounded knowledge and this is a deception for verily this is insincerity we have to understand our levels we have to know who we are and we have to know that just because you don't know it doesn't mean anything i remember remember one brother he was asked to write down something on a piece of paper in the Arabic language. And this brother was respected in the community, but he was respected as a brother. He wasn't respected as anything else. So he said, I don't know how to write the Arabic language. And today we find him with Allah's permission, writing, reading, and knowing the deen of Allah. What I see in this is sincerity, inshallah ta'ala, that he admitted that he didn't know, 
So later on in life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him success in learning the Arabic language and not being arrogant. So Allah blessed him with this language. Another thing we learn is that Jibreel alayhi salam is not likened. He's not, there is nothing similar to Jibreel on earth, meaning that you can't draw him. You can't make him into a statue or paint him. Even if you're painting Jibreel to teach your kids. This is incorrect. This is incorrect. You should not paint Jibreel alayhi salam who is not like this. He doesn't look the way that it's been described. He's not a man. This was the qadr of Allah that Allah decreed for that moment to show you two things. One is that Allah can do whatever he wishes. And the second thing is to teach you the religion. So you can't draw him for your kids and say, this is Jibreel. Because Allah describes Jibreel to be 600, to have 600 wings covering the horizons. So no painting, no painting, no drawing can liken to Jibreel. Rather, this is a lie against him. Wallahu ta'ala alam, and we'll stop here, inshallah ta'ala. We have finished the hadith, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, and we are going to go through the third part of the hadith, if I'm correct. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go through the third hadith, and from there, we can we can benefit from the next one. And inshallah ta'ala, Allah gives us the ability to carry on till we finish this. And we'll have upcoming books to go through. They do take long. And none of the books inshallah ta'ala will be taught in one day or two days. As this is not befitting. This is not the way that someone should be taught. A book in one day. A book that's 100 pages, 200 pages in one day. These are for advanced students of knowledge that can do this, as in they can go through it between themselves as a muraja, as a, as a revision or something. But to say that you're going to teach in one, three hours, you're going to teach a whole book. I don't know what benefit is going to come out of this. Wallah alam. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll take the questions. If there are any questions. So the question is, is it permissible to greet others with Jum'ah Mubarak? This wasn't done by the Sahaba or the Salaf. This shouldn't be done on Fridays. The scholars, they mention regarding this. And they say that this should be avoided. As this wasn't the practice of the Salaf. And they come with the best teachings and the best way of... Last week, there was a question about games with shirk. Is someone mushrik if he plays this kind of games? Wallahu alam. Wallahu alam. Brother, you spoke about riba as waging war against Allah and his messenger. What about some scholars who allowed it in Dar al-Kufr? I don't know of any scholar that allowed the river in Dar al-Kufr. If you're talking about Abu Hanifa, Allahu Alam, that's not evidence. And this is something that we've found amongst the Muslims is that we tend to take the statement of a scholar as evidence. In my previous lectures, I mentioned that the statement of a scholar is not evidence if it doesn't come with a text from the Quran, a clear ayah that's muhkam, that's clear, and not mutashabih, and not unclear or ambiguous, or a hadith, or an explanation by the Sahaba that they agreed upon 
This is hujjah. This is proof. A lot of people, they say, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah said this. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said this. Shaykh Fulan Fulan said this. Abu Hanifa said this. Imam Malik said this. Do you know that those same scholars that you quote, every single one of them will tell you if my words go against the Quran and the Sunnah, throw against the wall. Their teachings wasn't to follow them, what we find today amongst the youth. So I'll teach you something, inshallah ta'ala, that will close the door for doubts. Whenever you speak to anyone regarding any mas'ala, any, anything regarding the deen, the first question someone needs to be asked is, where is your evidence? If he says, Sheikh, stop him. Stop him straight away. I said, where is the evidence? He'll say again, Sheikh, Imam, whoever it may be, whether it's contemporary or whether it's the scholars of the past. So what will happen? He'll repeat himself one more time until you make him understand that what I want from you is evidence. And you teach him that evidence is qala Allah wa qala Rasul. Not qala Shaykh al-Islam or qala uh, whoever it may be from the contemporary scholars. This is not evidence. Once you learn this principle, you'll find that majority of the people who come with these doubts, they won't be able to carry on. And this has happened many times. Someone will come and say, I believe this, this, or he will bring you something. You have to ask him, where is your evidence? And evidence isn't just any ambiguous hadith or ambiguous. This is not the methodology of the Salaf. The methodology of the Salaf was a way, the overwhelming opinion of the Sahaba was what we are upon. The overwhelming, that overwhelming opinion of the Salaf is what we are upon. Not one statement from the Salaf, one statement from the Sahaba that goes against the text or goes against the Hadith. If it works like that, then everyone will follow anything. And Islam is preserved. And this is one of the ways it's preserved. It's, it's preserved from a methodology, a way of deriving rulings and going through it.